Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about making money and whether or not software development is about making money for me. So let's get into it. Well, I got this question from in one of the comments on an old video of mine where a person pointed out that Frederick, it sounds to me like you enjoy software development, like you enjoy coding, but you don't necessarily seem to enjoy working as a developer in a professional capacity. So is all of this stuff that you're doing about becoming financially independent so that you can stop working? And see, the thing here is that this is actually, I think, a pretty good question. It touches on kind of two things within software development and, well, not necessarily just in software development, but let me just kind of walk you through it. So the thing is, guys, if I've ever given you the impression that, and, or if somebody else has given you the impression that software development either is absolutely horrible or that it's absolutely amazing all the time, I hope that, you know, and um, this will be a mind blow, a mind blower for everybody, right? That's not the case. And this is true for any profession. It doesn't matter if you are working within your dream profession, you will have things that you like about it and you will have things you don't like about it. The thing is that you, I mean, the thing that dictates whether or not you like something or enjoy it is if the good outweighs the bad. And in software development, that's a question you need to answer for yourself. Because some people go into this field with this idea, and that's usually the people who suffer within the industry. And th these are the people who go in with the mindset, as I've said a few times before, that code is about code, that your job is to write software in accordance with either some type of theoretical mathematics or in some specific set of practices or anything of that. The, the, that's the wrong perception of what it is that you do. And it's something that, I mean, some people even go one further and they think that, oh yeah, they kind of get this thing that I'm saying, I'm telling them that, oh yeah, you know, guys, there's tons of ugliness in the software industry and there's tons of code and you will never, never, never work with code that is going to be beautiful or to be nice without legacy, at least not if you're doing anything serious. And some then take that as a, as a challenge to themselves saying that, okay, but then I'm going to be an advocate like the people I see on the tech talks. I'm going to be like one of those public speakers and promote best practices because I have, I've seen all the videos and I know what the people at Google, the, tech, the, the Google IO tech talks and all of these people, like they talk about these things, right? And guys, the dirty little secret is that the, this is their job the reason why they have the luxury of behaving in that fashion is because it is their job to behave in that fashion. It's very much like uh, the difference between you and them is very much like being a just a random musician and being a rock star. You have different perspectives on things because you have different life positions on things uh, in, uh, uh, within the industry. And the thing is that even if you decided today to be that sort of person who goes in and like pushes for best practices, odds are that you will uh, like find it as frustrating as if you're just the sort of person who believes that software is about software. Let me tell you what the perspective, the perspective that you should have, or what it should be, and why it should be that way. So the best perspective to have as a software developer, in my opinion, is to have the perspective that you are a craftsman. That is what you are. You are more, no more, no less. Your job is to craft software solutions in the same fashion a carpenter crafts a house or anything like that. That is the focus, that is the role that you have within the industry. And if we just walk through this analogy, as a craftsman, your job is not to dictate to your customer what the best solution is. Your job is to inform about what the best solution is or what the options of a solution to a solution, what options you have available to you. Because your customers and your boss and so forth, they will come with all kinds of different requests. And there's no way for you to, to like, you, you cannot take the position that you are going to abide by some best practices unless the situation allows you to do so. 
just uh, a few days ago I had a discussion with one of my junior co-workers she came up to me and showed me an issue she was explaining and this was with uh, trans a translation issue internationalization as we call it and she just pointed out the ugliness of a solution that we've had and she said that well Frederick I mean and this is her she's kind of getting from a point where she's afraid of everybody and now she's getting more confident and now she wants to and this is what we usually call like the improvement the improvement stage the code mock or so forth where a junior developer goes from being super scared of everybody to now having some confidence and starting to point out issues within the code base this is a good thing and a bad thing and it's a bit of a learning experience for quite for people who are more junior in the industry so she start, starts talking about you know Frederick this is really bad and I mean she just kind of walks me through how we handle translations and how the formatting isn't correct and we have no control over the formatting and that we have all these different use cases where we incorrectly format things right and she just kind of goes on this rant and I just listen to her I let her speak her mind and then she says but Frederick if we were to do you know if we were to move all of this over to the server and we moved all of these um, all of these uh, translations to this position and put some time into actually translating all of these things that are untranslated then you know this problem would be solved and I just nod to her and I say yes you are absolutely correct and then she kind of looks at me shocked like but and she goes oh okay but why aren't we doing that oh it's very simple uh, because your boss does, doesn't think that this is important enough to prioritize time and instead of this he he has decided that we're going to do these three or four things which are more important for the company and she kind of looks at him, but he looks at me and it's just like, uh, okay, I, they, she seemed to have expected me to say something like along the lines like, good job, you identified a really serious issue, issue here. We should drop all the other things we're doing and focus on this thing because this does, not this does not meet the sort of standards that we have put on ourselves. And instead I actually told her, see, this is the realization that you will come to now because I'm going to go through you. I'm going to do this once with you. We're going to do it together. So what we're going to do, is that we're going to think through the different options that we have here. So the best option, as you said, is to do a full migration of the translation system that we have now because it's not scalable in the, for in the format it is. We're going to, at some point, I can promise you, we're going to have to rewrite this or at least do a fairly serious time investment to make this work. Now you can present that option, that's option number one. Option number two right now is that, all right, you create a small abstraction here to, uh, that basically takes in the current locale and the market and the customer and so forth. And that, that small little function, it's extra weight on the front end of course, but it's going to take in a few parameters and it's going to return the correct formatting for this, uh, for this price right that we're talking about. And that is not as elegant, but it will work. It adds more weight. I mean, it's it's just kind of shuffling the problem forward because it's just a matter of time before we get a feature request that requires us to actually have this knowledge on the server. But for now, it could work if we just did it on the front end. That's number two. And the last thing is to completely ignore the problem or like basically just hard code it pretty much. Now, go to our boss. Like, go and talk to our product manager and explain and make your case and make let him make the decision said and done she goes and grabs our product manager i sit and i'm completely silent and she explains um basically she basically explains the problem and i have already told her that my my suspicion is that he's going to go for the middle ground because that's what they always do in software development and he basically does that exact thing they talk about the project and he um, and the, he really makes a strong case towards this ideal scenario of solving things in an ideal fashion and basically, finally, he just goes, yeah, I know what you're saying. We should really do this migration. You know what I'm going to do? And I already told her that he was going to do this. We're going to put a story card about this. I'm going to put this on the backlog. But since, we, I mean, we have a deadline right now. And we, I mean, we're, the client expects this to be done by the end of the week. So uh, go with the, with the function because that's, that's the, the, you know, that's it's still going to solve the problem. And then we will think about the long-term solution later. Said and done, she, he kind of walks off. And then I just talk, and I come over to her and she just, you know, we, we talk and I explain to her, this is your life. Your life, this is your life as a software developer. It doesn't matter what you feel, what you think, none of this matters. You can at best 
inform about the situation, about the options available, but at the end of the day, somebody else is going to make the call because you are unfortunately in the sort, as I said, you are a, you are a craftsman. Just as an architect building a building cannot have every craftsman on the team telling him or her how to build something in the correct fashion. So we need to align on something. And even in, in, like in an industry where you're building buildings, not every building is going to be perfect. In fact, quite a lot of construction projects have areas where the quality of the product is better and some areas where it's actually lower. Now, if you embrace this, if you start thinking in this fashion, as I said, the building is a pretty good analogy because if you're, if you're building an, you know, on a house from like 60 years ago, you will have a different level of quality on the project and the sort of stuff that you can do with that project is limited in comparison if you're building you know, the most cutting edge super skyscraper of today. Even if you were to build that though, you will find areas where it's, you know, things aren't possible to make in a perfect manner because you have limitations such as, such as resources and time. And because you have those limitations, you're going to feel frustrated because sometimes you want to do things better, but you just can't. So if these things are acceptable to you, you will love software development. They are acceptable to me. I absolutely love my job and I love the things that I do. And that's what I told the subscriber that, that for me, becoming a software developer or like, it's not about loving every single minute of everything because it's not possible to do so. Even the football players out there have something that annoys them, you know, or the rock star. I mean, they have pap paparazzis or whatever, people that make their perfect little dream life less attractive, just as I do, just as every profession does. So what I want you to take away from this is that, at least for me, financial in independency was never the goal of being a software developer. It is in fact very unlikely that that will be a sustainable, uh, sustainable thing for anybody who goes into software development. Being financially independent, I mean, there's a lot easier, there's a lot more ways that you can become financially independent than software development. And in fact, if you're the sort of person who wants to be a software developer for real, odds are that you're more like, as I explained, the sort of person who wants to actually do something. It's not the pr profession that people go into just because they want to make money. Because as I said, there's quite a lot of better ways of doing so. So what you should have as a focus is to really ask your that, yourself that question. Are you a craftsman or are you an idealist? You're most likely going to start out as an idealist, but the thing that's going to make you want to stay within the industry if you actually want to do this, is if you can get, understand that most of what you do is to learn how to master all of the ways that you could possibly do something, but on a daily basis, you simply pick the thing that is right for the, for the situation. It's not always going to be ideal, and that's something that you're going to have to live with. Have a great day.